Next up is, um, is uh, Brian Cox from uh, the University <laughs> of Manchester and from CERN. So he's European, right? Welcome. And uh, Brian, I'm, I'm so happy to have you with us because you're going to take us to a journey into the universe. Actually, is this, is this on? Yeah. yeah, you're on. And that yeah. is like not common. That it's not every day that you can go through the universe. So, Brian, thank you very much. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Right, we'll see if we can wire the laptop up first. I should be able to do this. I'm working on fixing the Large Hadron Collider at the moment. Let this be a bit of practice. It's a MacBook Air to go through the universe. That's uh, great. There we go. Well, I'd like to start actually with, with two notes of thanks. The first one, of course, is to Loic and Le Web for giving me this opportunity to speak in this wonderful venue. The second one is a bit more special. I actually want to thank uh, Nicole. Did you listen to the podcasts at all that were made previous to this conference? Fantastic podcasts. Uh, Nicole and I did an interview about two or three weeks ago now for that podcast, and we talked about CERN and the Large Hadron Collider and cosmology, the universe, and she said to me at the end of the podcast, wow, it, it sounds like what you're trying to say is love your universe, and I thought, that's a great idea for a talk, so I changed my talk in keeping with the theme of the web. So what I hope to do in the, last, the next 10, 15 minutes or so is to show you why I think we should love our universe, simple thing. This is a picture of the universe, actually just a picture of a piece of sky. If any of you do a bit of astronomy, you'll recognize it because that uh, collection of stars up there in the middle is the constellation of Orion. But the reason I want to show this is because I can zoom in on this picture to a piece of sky that was photographed by the Hubble Space Telescope. This is a, a real scale zoom in of that piece of sky. It's about a 50th of the size of a full moon. And you see it's an incredibly tiny and wonderful picture, still zooming. This is the deepest picture, the picture of the most distant objects in the universe, the deepest picture of the universe. What you can see there is beginning to appear are uh, different colored blobs, cloudy points of light deep within that image. Each one of the blobs of light on that picture turns out to be a galaxy. In fact, in that picture, there are over 10,000 galaxies, each with, on average, 100,000 million stars like our sun in them. If you extend that over the entire sky, we think there are 100,000 million, 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe, each with 100 billion suns. The light from the most distant galaxies in that picture began its journey 13 billion years ago. That's moments, really, about half a billion years after the universe began. The Earth is only 5 billion years old, so you're looking at objects there that were around in the universe, well, 7 billion years before the Earth was formed from a gas cloud. And I've just logged on to a wireless network. Very good. So <laughs> I want to show that picture because, first of all, if we're going to love the universe, we need to know how big it is. And I hope you can see from that remarkable picture that the universe is big, possibly infinite in extent. There's possibly a lot more than we can see in that picture, although possibly finite. Actually, as Woody Allen once said, it would be better if it were finite if you're the kind of person who can't remember where they put things but we don't know yet whether that's the case. My job is a particle physicist. Managed to find out that that universe, the 100 billion galaxies in that picture, and you and me and the Earth and everything we can see in the sky, is made of just 12 particles of matter stuck together by four forces of nature. The one on the bottom left there, the electron, is probably familiar to you. The U and D, the pink ones up there, are up and down quarks that make up protons and neutrons, which make up U. So you and me are made up of just three of those fundamental particles. You see at the bottom it says three generations of matter. 
Nature seems to have seen fit to make two copies of the particles that we are made of. And in fact, every star and planet we can see in the sky is made of. And we have no idea why nature has chosen to do that. All we know is that we think that those three generations were intimately related in allowing there to be any matter at all just after the Big Bang. So the universe is beautiful in that sense. We don't know why that's the case, but it seems to be the case. On the right, in the blue, you see the force carriers. The thing at the top is a photon, a particle of light, which in particle physics we speak of as carrying the force of electromagnetism. There are two other forces on that diagram. The G carries something called the strong nuclear force, which sticks nuclei together. And the W and Z carry something called the weak nuclear force. I want to come back to those a little bit later on. But suffice to say that that's the picture, the building blocks of the universe as we know at the turn of the 21st century. Everything you need to build a universe. And remarkably, we've managed to summarize how all that works in one beautifully simple equation. I mean, it might look like scribble, but actually that equation describes everything other than the force of gravity. It describes why the sky's blue, why nuclei stick together, why colors are the color that they are, why your body sticks together, all in four lines of beautiful mathematics. And the third line on there is about something called the Higgs particle. So you might have heard of that in the press. It's what the Large Hadron Collider at CERN is built to detect. It's responsible in our beautiful theory for the origin of mass in the universe, but we've not found it yet. That's what the LHC is designed to find. Well, I mention the LHC, I'm sure, seen this wonderful machine in the press. Its job is to explore the early universe and explore the building blocks of the universe. How does it do that, and why can it do that? Well, this is a picture of the evolution of the universe from the Big Bang to the present day. As far as we can tell, it began 13.7 billion years ago in a very hot and very simple state. And since then, it's expanded and cooled. And we think that the complexity that we see today in the universe, so things like human brains, computers, civilizations, are a property of an old and cold universe. As you look back in time towards the beginning, you find that the universe becomes simpler and easier to understand. And as I've mentioned, we think that it's built of no more than 12 objects. Everything we can see can be constructed in that way. The Large Hadron Collider's job is to recreate the conditions that were present less than a billionth of a second after the universe began in order that we can reveal, hopefully, that underlying simplicity and better understand the complexity that's emerged in this old and cold epoch. That is a picture of the Large Hadron Collider, 27 kilometers in circumference. It sits below the ground in Geneva. We accelerate hydrogen nuclei, so particles called protons, to 99.999999% the speed of light, and we smash them together up to 600 million times a second. And in each of those collisions, we can recreate those conditions that were present in the early universe in order to understand it. This is a picture of the inside of the LHC. Um, many of you may have seen that we had a slight glitch after having a wonderful startup day back on the 10th of September. The glitch was actually in the interconnect between two of those magnets. What you see there is a, a slice through the LHC before it was completed. The two circular things, actually, the big circles in the middle of that pipe are the, the beam pipes themselves. They carry the beams of protons, which would actually fit inside something the diameter of a human hair but yet carry the energy of an aircraft carrier traveling at 30 miles an hour. So it's a machine that carries immense power. Um, we had a glitch, and we blew one of our magnets up. The latest <laughs> news that I get is that the magnets will be back in and the machine will be back on at the end of June, and then we'll begin exploring the earliest moments after the Big Bang. So positive news, at least, from the LHC. The collisions themselves occur in giant cameras, this is the camera that I work on. It's called the Atlas camera. Uh, you may be able to see there at the bottom, actually, um, two EU standard size physicists, the green blob there and the purple blob there, to get some sense of the size of this thing. 44 meters in uh, wide, 22 meters in diameter, weighing 7,000 tons. And its job is simply to photograph those collisions so that we can see how the universe behaved in its earliest times 
reveal its underlying simplicity and beauty. This is a very famous picture I'm sure many of you have seen of the Atlas experiment as it was being constructed uh, with a real physicist stood in the middle. In the center of there is where those mini big bangs occur. And this is a picture of the end of the Atlas experiment, actually with me in the white hat stood there next to the LHC. So that tunnel, that blue tunnel, is the thing that extends 27 kilometers out underneath the ground, uh, underneath Geneva and France. And just before I leave the LHC, this is a picture that we all wanted to see and we all saw back on the 10th of December. This is a picture of the first collision in Atlas. So this was one of the LHC beams colliding actually with part of the machine and showering new particles into the Atlas detector. This tells us that the machine works and the detectors work. So that's the LHC. The talk is about love your universe. I mentioned that we believe that in the very earliest moments, a billionth of a second after the universe began, it was very simple, and now it's very complex. Where does that complexity come from? Well, stars are the complexity factories. In the early universe, the very earliest universe, we know that there was only hydrogen and helium present in the universe. Now, it's one of those kind of cliched but wonderful thoughts that everything else carbon, oxygen, iron, the complex molecules and atoms of life came from the first generation of stars. Carl Sagan wonderfully said that we're all made of star stuff. Those factories, those complexity factories, are stars. But I want to just do perhaps one minute of complicated stuff, which I hope you want to follow, because I think it gives some insight into the real wonder of those complexity factories. It's one minute of nuclear physics, so you can switch off for a minute if you don't want to hear that, but I hope you come with me. I want to talk about the generation of carbon in the hearts of stars. Remember, there was no carbon in the universe at the Big Bang. Stars burn hydrogen into helium first and foremost. The sun burns 600 million tons of hydrogen into helium every second. 600 million tons a second. But stars also make heavier nuclei, fortunately. The way that it happens is that the heliums start sticking together. So two heliums together makes beryllium. Three makes carbon. Now, it was known in the 1950s that it wasn't possible to stick a beryllium with a helium to make a carbon in the center of stars. And that was a big mystery, because without carbon, of course, there would be no us. Carbon does get made in stars. It was postulated that there was a special form of carbon which was slightly heavier than the normal form, so-called excited state. If this existed, then it would be possible for a blink of an eye actually a 10,000 million millionth of a second window in the heart of a star for helium to stick together to make carbon. So the prediction was made that this kind of carbon must exist. It was called an anthropic prediction by an astronomer called Fred Hoyle. Subsequently, that delicate, heavy form of carbon was found. But even more remarkably, if that carbon were just slightly too heavy, so if the forces of nature were not balanced exquisitely to allow it to exist for just long enough, then it would all decay away again once it were made, and you would just end up with helium. Incredibly, for every 10,000 carbons that are made in that way, four of them can decay by emitting two particles of light and turn into the stable form of carbon that we are made of. For that to happen, you need an exquisite balance between the strong nuclear force the weak nuclear force, and the electromagnetic force. Nobody knows why that should be the case, but it's a fine tuning at the levels of a billion, billion, billionth of a percent. It's quite remarkable. Fortunately for us, the universe is made in that way, and carbon can be made in the hearts of stars. Now, of course, that carbon can't stay there. It gets distributed when stars die in supernova explosions, thrown out into the universe, and bits of that carbon and the other elements, iron, gold, everything that's heavier than helium, condense in dust clouds to form new stars and planets, like this one, the Earth. The wonderful thing for me about the Earth is I think it gets more beautiful the further away you get from it. 
So the more distant, the, the greater the distance you observe it from. That's a beautiful picture of the Earth. This is a very famous and very beautiful and powerful picture of the Earth. It was taken actually on my first Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve 1968 by Apollo 8 as it came up around the back of the moon. Many environmentalists have said that this was the picture that started the modern environmental movement because it's a picture of the fragility and beauty of the Earth from behind the back of the moon. This, which I hope you can just see, is one of my favorite pictures. It was taken by the Voyager spacecraft on its journey to the distant gas planets in 1977. You can see the Earth, the crescent Earth at the bottom, and I hope you can see the very faint crescent moon at the top. It's the first picture from deep space of the Earth-Moon system. And this picture, which is an incredibly beautiful picture taken about two years ago now, a picture of Saturn, from the spacecraft Cassini. What you're looking at is a picture of Saturn backlit from the sun in one frame. You can't see it here, but I hope when I zoom in you can see it. Can you see that tiny dot between Saturn's rings? I hope you can see that. That turns out to be a picture of our planet Earth. That's what planet Earth looks like, suspended between the rings of Saturn 750 million miles away. One of the great pictures, I think, that the human race has yet taken. So the remarkable story we've learned from the machines of modern science is that our Earth is a, is a, well, a product of an incredibly delicate and finely balanced series of steps. You need a universe 13.7 billion years old because you need generations of stars to make carbon. That's not the end of the story, though. Of course, on one planet, and only one that we know of, life began. It's the only place we know of in the universe that life began. And quite remarkably, some of that life, only three million years ago, it's worth remembering, walked upright and left footprints in the mudflats of Tanzania, and only 30 years ago, left a footprint for the first time on another world. Our species managed that in only three million years, the blink of an eye in cosmic time and built a civilization which can be seen in this beautiful picture that can light the darkness up. I think the most wonderful thing in that picture from NASA is the lights of civilization which depend, as I said, on this wonderful sequence of rare events in the universe. So that brings me to, I think, one final question. Again, a cliched question. There have been several almost cliches, I think, in this talk. But when you think about them, they're cliches that are worth repeating. We're all made of star stuff, for example. Here's a cliche question. Are we alone in the universe? As I showed at the start, the universe is immensely big. And as far as we know, and we've looked in our nearest neighborhood, there's no other intelligent life in the universe at all. In fact, strange as it may seem, we have no evidence there's any other life in the universe, in all those billions of galaxies and billions of suns. How does that make you feel? Well, this is the most beautiful picture, I think, taken of the planet Earth, and I'm sure you can't see it, but it's a very famous picture. On the end of that arrow is planet Earth, the most distant picture ever taken, taken from over four billion miles away by the Voyager spacecraft when it was on its journey out of the solar system. It's a picture which is famously called the pale blue dot picture. If we're alone in the universe, then does that make you feel lonely, insignificant, and vulnerable? Or does it make you feel extremely special? To me, the question is like asking someone who's walking through a dark forest with the green of the leaves, perhaps no sunlight gets through the canopy, completely dark, and you see on the floor a single red orchid. What do you think about that orchid? Do you look at it and think, that's insignificant? Or do you think, that's a beautiful, rare thing to be treasured? I think the perspective that modern science has given us means that at least we should respect our specialness in a very cold and lonely universe. So perhaps, I think I want to leave you with this thought. I think that this perspective tells us that maybe learning to love our universe is the first step in learning to love ourselves. Thank you. <laughs>